All right, welcome back. We're gonna start with this example right here where we have to find the derivative of the function 7x plus three. So the derivative of a function is equal to the limit as delta x approaches zero of the following function, f of x plus delta x minus f of x all divided by delta x. And if you wanna know where this comes from, be sure to watch the lesson for this topic that you can find on the channel. So then to solve this, we're going to plug in x plus delta x into our x for the function here, because that is what this right here means. Then we'll subtract our function and divide by delta x. So we'll write the limit as delta x approaches zero is equal to seven times x plus delta x, right? We plugged in this quantity into this x, and then we're going to add our three and then subtract our function seven x plus three. Remember, always put your function in parentheses so that this negative is distributed to each part and not just the seven x. And then this is all going to be divided by delta x. So then we're going to distribute our seven and our negative, and then we'll simplify. So we'll have that this is equal to the limit of delta x approaching zero of seven x plus seven delta x plus three minus seven x minus three. Again, we just distributed seven to each part of this quantity and this negative to each part of this quantity. And this is all divided by delta x. All right, so now I see that we have some terms that cancel out. We have a positive 7x and a negative 7x that will become zero. We have a positive three and a negative three that becomes zero. So then all we're left with is the limit as delta x approaches zero of this term and this term, which is seven delta x divided by delta x. And there we see we have that common factor of delta x that we can also cancel out. And so then this is going to be equal to the limit as delta x approaches zero of seven. And we know that the limit of a constant, no matter what we're approaching, is going to be that constant. So this is equal to seven. So that is the derivative of this function right here, seven x plus three. So now we're gonna do an example that is going to take a little more time to go through the limit process, but I think it'll be very rewarding when you get your answer at the end. So we're gonna be finding f prime of x, which is another way to write the derivative of the function f of x. And then we're gonna be finding the slope at x equals negative one, or the value of the derivative at x equals negative one for the function x cubed minus eight x. So I'm gonna start by writing our limit definition, and I'm gonna fast forward that so that we can get to the actual evaluating. Okay, so I wrote our limit definition of a derivative here. So now let's plug in our values for each part of this function, and then we will begin our solving process. So this is going to be equal to the limit as delta x approaches zero of x plus delta x to the third power minus eight times x plus delta x. So what we did here is we plugged in this x plus delta x into each x part of this function. So we have delta x plus x cubed, which is this x cubed, and we have eight times x plus delta x, which is this eight x right here. Then we're going to subtract our original function. Again, remember your parentheses. And then this is all divided by delta x. All right, so then we can do some simplifying. So the first thing I'm gonna do is rather than completely expand this cube right here, that would be kind of annoying to do, I see that I have a common factor of x plus delta x here and here. So I'm gonna pull that out and that will make this a little bit easier to evaluate. We're gonna have the limit as delta x approaches zero of x plus delta x. Remember, this is that term we're gonna be pulling out and we're gonna be left with x plus delta x squared minus eight minus x cubed plus eight x. Again, I'm just distributing that negative to each part here. And this will all be divided by delta x. And just to quickly explain this part one more time, we saw we had a common factor of x plus delta x here and here, and I pulled it out, right? If I were to distribute this back into each part, we would be right back here. But we took out this from our eight terms, now we just have eight, and we took out one of these from here. So now we have just this term squared left over. So now I'm going to move this up here, and then we'll go on to our next step, because I need more space to do this problem. All right, so we're gonna have that this equals the limit as delta x approaches zero. And so what's the next thing that we wanna do? Well, now I think we can expand this squared quantity because expanding a squared quantity is a lot easier, in my opinion, than expanding a cubed quantity. So this is gonna make things a little bit easier. So we'll do that next. We're gonna have x plus delta x 
times this x squared plus 2x delta x plus delta x squared, and then that minus 8. And then we'll close that, and then we'll have our minus x cubed plus 8x. And this is still all divided by delta x. And remember, when you square a quantity, it's the first term squared plus these two terms multiplied together times 2, which is where this comes from, and then our last term squared. So now we have a lot of distributing we have to do. We're going to multiply this term by each of these terms and this term by each of these terms as well. And then we'll finally be able to do some simplifying. So this is going to be equal to the limit as delta x approaches 0 of x cubed and Right now, I'm just taking this term and multiplying it by each of these terms. So we're going to have x cubed plus 2x squared delta x because we already had an x here. And so now we're multiplying this x by this x. We'll have 2x squared delta x plus x times delta x squared minus 8x. So we multiplied x by this term and this term. Then we have to go through and multiply this term by all of these. So now we're going to have x squared delta x plus 2x delta x squared, right? Because we already have this delta x. So if we multiply another delta x in there, it's going to be squared. And then we'll have plus delta x cubed. All right, I gave myself a little more space now. So let's finish off by multiplying this term by this term. So we'll have minus 8 delta x. And then we can't forget this part right here, which is minus x cubed plus 8x. And I just barely fit that all in there. All right, so now this is all still over delta x. Whew. All right, so now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look for terms that will cancel out so that we can simplify this a little bit. So let's look around here. First thing I'm going to see is this x cubed is positive, and then all the way over here we have a negative x cubed. So I'm going to cross those out. Those will cancel to be 0. And I also see that we also have a negative 8x and an 8x, so those are going to cancel out. And then from there, I don't see anything that's going to cancel, but I do see like terms that I can add together. So what I see is that I have a x squared delta x term here. There's two of them. And then we also have an x squared delta x term here. So those are like terms. So I'm going to box those in so we know that they are similar. Then I'm going to see that we have an x and delta x squared term here. And then we also have it over here, except there's two of them. We have x and then delta x squared. So now I'll box those in so we know that those are similar. And then what we're left with here and here they don't have any other like terms, so they're just good as they are. So now we're going to combine what's left over, and then we will simplify and see what we have then. All right, once again, I cleaned up my work so that we can go through this problem, and we're going to have the limit as delta x approaches 0 of this, but now let's combine our terms. So we have 2x squared delta x and x squared delta x. So we're going to have 3x squared delta x, and then we're going to combine our green boxed terms. So now we're going to have plus 3x delta x squared. And then we just have this term and this term. So we have plus delta x cubed minus 8 delta x. And this is still all over delta x. But now what I notice is that every term that's left over has a delta x in it. So now we can reduce everything by that delta x. So now we'll be left with the limit as delta x approaches 0 of 3x squared. Remember, we are canceling out a delta x out of each one of these terms. So now I marked all those, so now we see where the canceling is happening. And then we're going to be adding our 3x times delta x. It's no longer squared because we are taking one out right here. And then we're going to have plus delta x squared because it was cubed, but we're taking one out. And then we have minus 8 because it's losing the only delta x that it had. And now we have a limit that we can plug in 0. We no longer have that delta x in the denominator, so we're not going to have an undefined value, and we can solve this as we would a normal limit. But remember, we only plug in 0 for delta x, not x. But before we do that, I'm going to clean up my work one more time so that we can finally solve this very long limit. All right, so now let's plug in our value of 0 for delta x, and we're going to have that this is equal to 3x squared plus 3x times 0 plus 0 squared minus 8. And so then we see that this is going to become 0, and this will be 0. So then our derivative will be 3x squared minus 8. And that is finally our answer to this problem. A lot of work, 
But now we see that the derivative of x cubed minus 8x is 3x squared minus 8. But we have one more thing to answer, and that is, what is the derivative at x equals negative 1? Well, we'll plug that in, and we will have that f prime of negative 1 is equal to 3 times negative 1 squared minus 8, and that's going to be equal to 3 times 1, because negative 1 squared is 1. So we'll have 3 times 1 minus 8, and that is going to equal negative 5, because 3 minus 8 would be negative 5. So that was a lot of work, but I have one more example I want to show you before we end this video. All right, so for this example, our function is 2 divided by the square root of x, and we want to find the derivative of that function as well as the value of that derivative at x equals 1. So this is a different notation that you might see sometimes, is that when you're asked to find the derivative in this notation, when you're actually plugging a value into the derivative, it's written in this way. You have the derivative of f of x such that x is equal to 1. So we'll get to that once we find the derivative, but for now, let's go through and find the actual derivative of this function. So once again, I'm going to write the limit definition of a derivative, and I'll speed it up so that we can get right to the process of evaluating it. Okay, so for this example, I used h instead of delta x, and sometimes you'll see that in textbooks. You'll see that in your problems, you'll have an h instead of a delta x, and so I thought I would just throw that in here for a little bit of variety, because it doesn't matter what this variable is, just doing this so that you get to see a different variable rather than delta x all the time. So our first step is to plug everything in, right? We're going to plug in our x plus h into this function, and then we'll also subtract the function from it. So let's do that. We'll have the limit as h approaches 0 of 2 over the square root of x plus h minus 2 over the square root of x. And this is all divided by h. Now, this is where our methods for evaluating limits really comes in handy, because now, what do I see? I see some fractions that I can get a common denominator for so that I can evaluate this limit. Because as it stands right now, we have an indeterminate form because this h in the bottom would be zero if we plugged in zero, and so we can't evaluate it because of that. So let's get a common denominator between these two fractions, and then maybe we can simplify this a little bit more. So this will be equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of 2 over the square root of x plus h multiplied by what is in the denominator of the other fraction. So we're going to multiply that by the form of 1 of the square root of x over the square root of x minus 2 over the square root of x times the denominator here in the form of 1. So that's going to be square root of x plus h over the square root of x plus h, and this is still all divided by h. So now we want to distribute. We want to simplify each of these so that we do have that common denominator. So this is going to be equal to the limit as h approaches 0. And I'm just going to write this bar right away. So we're going to have 2 times the square root of x over the square root, and we're going to multiply this x into each part here, x squared plus xh. And then we'll subtract this stuff over here. We'll have 2 times the square root of x plus h divided by the same denominator, which will be x squared plus x times h, because this x multiplied into here would give us x squared plus x times this h. And this is still all over h. So now I'm going to clean this up a little bit and then we'll move on to our next step. All right, so I cleaned it up and now we are ready for our next step, which is just combining these two fractions and then we'll go from there. So I have that this is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of 2 times the square root of x minus 2 times the square root of x plus h all divided by the square root of x squared plus x times h, and this is still all divided by h. And so this would all be in the numerator, and h is technically over 1, and the best way to simplify something like this would be to multiply by a form of 1 of 1 over h divided by 1 over h, so that we can get rid of this h on the bottom and just have a numerator and a denominator of one fraction and not multiple fractions going on here. So we're going to be multiplying by 1 over h over 1 divided by h. And once again, I'm going to need more space, so let's quickly clean things up a little bit. All right, so now we're ready to do our next step. So we're going to have that this is equal to the limit as h approaches 0, and this down here is going to cancel to 1, so the denominator now doesn't matter. This up here is going to be our new fraction, so I'm just going to write that right away. So we're going to have 2 times the square root of x minus 2 times the square root of x plus h. The numerator does not change because we're multiplying it by 1. 
And in the denominator, we're just multiplying h by this quantity. So now we'll have h times the square root of x squared plus x times h. All right, so now we're simplified even further. But now we still have that h in the denominator, so we still have an indeterminate form, and we still have to do some more manipulating. So what can we do now? Well, now we can use our rationalizing method from our limit evaluating methods to rationalize this function because we have this quantity here that we can multiply by the conjugate of. So now we're going to do that. So we're going to multiply by the conjugate, which is going to be 2 times the square root of x plus 2 times the square root of x plus h. It's just the same thing as this term, but with a plus sign instead of a negative. If this was plus over here, then this would be negative. The conjugate is just the opposite. And of course, this needs to be a form of 1, so we're going to put the same thing in the denominator. And once again, I'm going to clean up so that we can continue on with this problem. So let's simplify. We're going to have that this is equal to the limit as h approaches 0. And remember, the whole point of multiplying by conjugates is that we're going to get some nice terms in the numerator. So we're going to have this term squared minus this term squared. That's going to be a result of multiplying by the conjugate. So we're going to have 4x minus 4 times x plus h. And on the bottom, we're going to have a very big denominator of this times all of this. So I'm going to try to fit that under here. I didn't give myself much space. But we're going to have h times the square root of x squared plus x times h. And that's all going to be multiplied by 2 times the square root of x plus 2 times the square root of x plus h. All right, so then we can simplify this to the limit as h approaches 0. And we can distribute this 4 to the x plus h and see what happens then. So we'll have 4x minus 4x minus 4h. And this is all going to be underneath that same denominator that I'll write here real quickly. OK, so now I see that we have two terms that are going to cancel, specifically this 4x and this negative 4x that will become 0. And then we'll be left with just this negative 4h on the top. And that will allow us to simplify by removing the common factor of this h in the top and the bottom. So that is where we are headed next. All right, we are almost finished with this problem. So let's finally simplify here to the limit as h approaches 0 of negative 4h all over that same denominator. And then we can cancel out that h to finally finish our simplification here. And then we will have the limit as h approaches 0 of negative 4 all over that same denominator. And now we can finally plug in 0 because we're not going to have an indeterminate form because we removed that single h from the denominator. So now plugging in 0 is going to be our final step. All right, so now let's go and plug in 0. We're going to have that this is equal to negative 4 divided by square root of x squared plus x times 0. Remember, we're just plugging in 0 for h and not x times 2 times the square root of x plus 2 times the square root of x plus 0. If we simplify that, we're going to have negative 4 over the square root of x squared, because this term here is going to be 0, multiplied by 2 times the square root of x plus 2 times the square root of x. And then we can finally simplify by saying that this is equal to negative 4 over the square root of x squared times 4 square roots of x, because 2 square roots of x plus 2 square roots of x equals 4 square roots of x. And then we will have negative 4 over 4 times the square root of x cubed. And then one more thing we can do is reduce this by this factor of 4, and then we will have that this is equal to negative 1 over the square root of x cubed. And that is our answer for this derivative. And then if we want to know this or the value of the derivative at x equals 1, we would just plug 1 into this and 1 cubed is 1, the square root of that 1 is 1, and then it would be negative 1 divided by 1, which is negative 1. So then we would say that this is equal to negative 1. All right, and those are all the examples that I wanted to go over in this video. But if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments. But that's all I have for now, so I will see you next time.